Hey everyone. So the film that's coming up shortly is a conversation we had yesterday with Nick Gabriel, the original co-host of London Real, and Coffeezilla, and a few other people in the Rebel Wisdom digital campfire. And I just wanted to let you know about a Medium article that I've just written and posted in the show notes below, and I'll do it as a pinned comment as well. Uh, the title is, Did Brian Rose Use the Money He Scammed from His Followers to Run for Mayor? which is the open question about the money that uh, was donated to the digital freedom platform and whether that was used for his mayoral bid. So have a look. I've tried to pull together all of the publicly available uh, information and put it into context and try to kind of update where we're at right now. What are the open questions? And I think what are going to be the open questions that are asked most keenly after the election once Brian has to submit all of the returns and submit all the paperwork to the Electoral Commission. So do have a read of that if you're interested in the kind of the nitty gritty, the details, and I hope you enjoy the film. Yeah, the last couple of days have been quite extraordinary. So I've been covering the London Real story since last year, since the, since the digital freedom platform really, when it just was like, okay, there's something up here something bizarre is going on. And I started covering it then. And then the London mayor camp, there's that whole backstory, which I'm sure people will be familiar with. And the London mayor story came along. And for a long time, it looked like it was a crazy thing to do because obviously Brian would be subject to scrutiny. People would see what he'd been up to in the past. But the media coverage at the beginning was really terrible. It was like the journalists hadn't even done a basic Google search. They hadn't found a Vice article about the digital freedom platform. And for quite a while, it looked like he was kind of he was kind of getting off scot free, and then just in the last couple of days, it all seems to have started to kind of come tumbling down because of this interview that these amazing fifteen year olds did on this Politics Relaxed podcast. So they did this amazing interview. They did a proper interview with him where they held him to account. They asked him about the digital freedom platform. They asked him about the courses. They refused to let him kind of just basically. Uh, bluff and get away with it. And he left the interview early. He cut it short early. And then what's pretty astonishing is that he recorded the call at his end and then uploaded it to London Reel's website, London Reel's YouTube site, and put a copyright claim on it so that when they put their, their version up, it was all automatically flagged by YouTube, which is on one level, it's kind of genius, evil genius stuff. On another level, it's what on earth are you doing getting into a, a battle with 15-year-old kids? So they then, over the last couple of days, have been trying to get attention for it. They've managed to get attention. Uh, Michael Crick, the journalist, tweeted it out. They've just got it on Guido Forks, which is the blog that every single political journalist in Fleet Street looks at. Pretty much everyone in the media looks at. It's on there. About an hour and a half ago, it appeared on there. And today, just a few hours ago, when it was put up on another blog called Left Foot Forward, they went to Brian's media team and asked him for a response. And Brian's media team accused the kids of lying about what happened, saying that he didn't cut the interview short. <laughs> Which, as a journalist, that's not a good media strategy when they've got the receipts, when they've got the evidence that it's not true. So they've now come out literally in the last hour and said, no, that's not true. So now the story, probably tonight and for the next day or two until the mayoral election, because there's nothing else going on in the mayoral election, it's not really a two-horse race, is going to be Brian Rose in tit-for-tat exchange with 15-year-old kids. It's like... You, it, it just sums up, and I'm going to come to Nick in a second, because this sums up... It's like the short term thinking of thinking, I know I'll deal with this problem by making a short term lie about what the kids have done. Oh, they turned up late to the interview and I didn't cut it short. Actually blows up into a much bigger issue because it's it's just extraordinary. It's kind of like thinking on your feet and thinking you're thinking you're a genius by putting it up and blocking their their. Like it's it's clever. Like it was clever to have thought, okay, I'll make sure that they can't, I'll copyright claim it before they could put it up. But just it's this it's this balance of 
clever in the short term and absolutely insanely stupid in the long term that is that makes Brian the griff that keeps on giving and is just astonishing. Nick, I've been kind of keeping you updated on this by sending you a few things on WhatsApp and stuff. And <laughs> what have you made of the last couple of days? Calm as a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all. The, I mean, that's the line that just keeps coming back to me. It's like it's all um, it's all coming full circle for Brian, and that all the people he's stepped on, all the people he's walked over, all the people he's disrespected, all the people he's lied to, all the people he's cheated. It seems now the universe is bringing it all back at the point where um, it, it's going to hurt him the most, and. Uh, a part of me actually is sitting back with a bit of shock. Is it Schadenfreude, the German term? Schadenfreude. Um, yeah, Schadenfreude. And, and another part of me actually feels sorry for the guy because he's clearly he's clearly a tormented man. Um, and another part of me is just watching uh, in amusement because, as you said, it is the grift that keeps on giving. It's, it's kind of comical. Uh, you said something about this about cleverness how it's clever and i'm of the opinion that cleverness and wisdom are actually diametrically opposed the one comes from generally the weak egoic part of us and the other one comes from generally the higher level more connected part of us and uh, that cleverness isn't doing him any favors right now it's just coming back to bite him in the ass which is I don't know, kind of sad, but um, also for all of us watching, I guess most of us have been uh, victims of him and his, his schemes uh, in one way or another. And I guess it's kind of entertaining for us. And funny enough, I, I wanted to address that on this call because, uh, you know, I'm really trying to get to the point in my life where I don't don't operate on ideas of vengeance or anger or hatred or I don't hold grudges. I'm, I'm definitely not there yet. Um, and I, I know you wanted to address this and I'm, I'm more than happy to, but I think we all, hopefully we can all use this as a lesson to see, I don't know, just a high level meaning behind all this or the purpose behind all this instead of just like ragging on the guy. And don't get me wrong, he, he deserves to be ragged on, but I think we need to balance it as well with like maybe some higher level, like thinking about the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. I mean, as I said at the beginning, the intention of this call very much was kind of like, what, what are the positives that we can take? But I also felt like we, we needed a little bit of space for kind of venting. And um, yeah, just kind of like, where are we at right now before we kind of get into that? So yeah, just this turnaround over the last couple of days has been really refreshing to see and the nature of it as well with the 15 year old kids it's like it's Scooby Doo 101. It's Scooby like Doo, yeah. I would have got away with it if it wasn't for these pesky kids. <laughs> it's just like that. It's I was, I, I've been watching um, the Reddit threads and seeing a bunch of those Scooby Doo comments, and they always make me smile. Uh, it's the funny thing again for me. If yeah, we might as well rag on him for a little bit to vent. Um, but it, it's how he just keeps doubling down on. on I, I don't know what it is. If it's this American mentality. Uh, he once said to me something, one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave to me, uh, actually, uh, and there were a few gems in those few years that we were friends and worked together. He said, when you decide to do something in your life, you have to swing for the fences. And that always stuck with me. And I carried that with me. And I, I really took that advice to heart. And I think with him, it's the same kind of thing, except he doesn't, he's swinging for the wrong fences or he uses the wrong kind of bat to swing, right? Like he's using a, a badminton racket instead of a baseball bat or not a great analogy, but he just, he's trying so hard. He's just trying the wrong way and he's doing the wrong things. Um, and I was actually, this, this to me is a very interesting study in uh, the idea of work ethic, because, you know, our, our world preaches that, that hard work is, is almost invariably the solution to anything. And what I've realized is that hard work when mated to the wrong uh, paradigm or the wrong philosophy actually just compounds negatives. It doesn't erase them. Uh, and I think that's kind of what's happening with Brian is he has this philosophy and, and this narcissistic um, sociopathic or, or 
psychopathic. I don't know which one of those he is. I'm not a psychologist, but it's clearly some sort of pathology within him. And that has been mated to this incredible ambition and work ethic. And then that just causes it to compound and spiral further out of control. Um, and I think that's what's happening with these kids, you know, instead of just sucking it up and saying, okay, well, these guys are asking me hard questions. I'm just going to uh, ignore it. Uh, he tries to cancel the video and then he tries to get his press agent to say something negative. And it's just this kind of like doubling down, doubling down, keep swinging, keep going, keep going. And uh, it's, it's kind of sad. It's, it's clear, the strategy is clearly not working for him. Yeah, there's some already some great questions in the chat that I'd like to come to in a bit. Um, one, do you think after seeing Brian's antics over the past years allowed us to self-reflect and see our own shortcomings, which I'd love to come to in a bit. And those are the kind of, sure. that's, um, and I also want to want to pick up on something you just said, Nick, about um, but something that I because I've been thinking about this a lot and obviously thinking about kind of like I, I haven't wanted it since the beginning. Rip, for people who know Rebel Wisdom, the, the whole point for me is trying to bring a sort of deeper lens than I had when I was a journalist. I was like, what can we learn from this and what what are the deeper dynamics that are playing out? And something I thought about a lot, and I think people have already commented in the chat, how Brian changed when he um, connected with Dan Pena. Like, and this is a real, like the amazing thing about Dan Pena, I don't know if people have watched videos with him. There's something incredibly compelling about him. There's something compelling and also like repulsive at the same time. The thing I think is most amazing about Dan Pena is I think in some ways he's very coherent. And if you believe that your, your ego is you, that's the only thing that matters, that when you die, you're dead. There's no, there's, there's nothing more than you individually and what you can, what you can accumulate during your life, which is, I think, the dominant worldview of, of this, of much of the world right now, then what Dan Pena is teaching makes some sort of sense. Like it makes some sort of coherent sense. And I think he kind of, like I think Brian kind of thought that anyway, but he sharpened up that perspective in Brian. Whereas you, Nick, and, and I, and I, I know many, many others on the call, I'm sure, like believe in something greater. Like that's kind of what was the, that was what was astonishing, I think, and attractive about London Real at the beginning. And someone posted a comment on our interview that I'm going to read out, or I paraphrase it to read out, that really made sense of it for me, which was effectively that when you started up London Real together, you were kind of, you were, you were copying to some degree or being inspired by um, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's a deeply kind of spiritual guy. He's a deeply into his psychedelics. He's a, he's a really kind of ethical, solid guy. And you brought that quality, like when you started it as a co-host, you brought that quality to London Real. You were effectively the brand of London Real. And this guy said in the comment, and I thought it was brilliant, he said, Brian associated with you for long enough so that he got that brand by association, that he absorbed that brand by association. And then when he no longer needed it, you were surplus to requirements. But that, that brand, that sort of like, there is more to life than this there is something spiritual, there is something, we are more than the sum of our parts, the world is more than the sum of its parts, and we see it through psychedelics, we see it through all these different ways of, like that Tantra on there, you've had all of these different kind of um, deeper perspectives on what it means to be human, like th that was there at the beginning, and I think it got hollowed out more and more and more until now it is a Dan Pena shell of a cryptocurrency, get rich quick, um, it, scam. It's like a sh it's, it's now a, a complete shell of what it was. And that for me, that, that's the depth that I think, like we talked about this on, on Rebel Wisdom, like game A and game B. Game A, the game A system is like a self-terminating system. And for me, what London Real is now epitomizes that game A system. It's a hollowed out shell of something that used to be or originally had some some content. Sure, uh, and I think you're very accurate in in the way you've described it. I, I really appreciated that. Uh, you know, after the first couple of years, uh, that after I left, 
uh, I remember once I was sitting with my girlfriend at the time and um, I don't know, she stumbled upon a line in real video in which he had uh, this very spiritual woman on, I cannot remember her name, but she'd written a very popular spiritual book. And I remember I got really uh, angry about it because I was still quite bitter, but also because the, the truth is Brian is a, is a scientific materialist, right? Like he, he pushes a narrative and the agenda that he is like connected and he, he loves everyone and he just wants us all to grow and blah, blah, blah. But I, I remember having a conversation with him once in, in which he, I asked his, his perspective on, um, on religion or well, not religion, but his, his spiritual beliefs. And he just said, like, he was an atheist. He was like, I don't believe in anything. Like when you die, you're dead. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a totally valid belief system. It's not mine. It doesn't seem to be yours or most of the people listening, but to then claim that you are this champion for uh, an alternative is super duplicitous and misleading and dishonest. And I think that's what is, this ultimately comes down to with Brian. It's, it's this repeated dishonesty. And I was thinking about it earlier when you were, dis, uh, when you were inter introducing me and, and, and catching people up on the events. What dishonesty is, is a, it's ultimately cowardice. It's the inability to face um, the consequences of being truthful. That's ultimately what it comes down to, right? Like if you're afraid of what will happen if you say the truth. And uh, that, that's the thing with him. He just keeps lying and, and putting on this mask. And it's just all inherently dishonesty, which we can track back to all being, uh, the root of that all is fear. There's something he's very afraid of. And uh, I don't know what that is, but <laughs> maybe one day we'll find out. Well, I know one thing that he's afraid of, and that is... 15-year-old kids. And Coffeezilla. Yeah. <laughs> is he here? Hey, guys. How's it going? Yeah, yeah. I just made it. Sorry about that. Got the times mixed up. Hey, bud. Been enjoying your stuff a lot lately, Coffee. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tough keeping up with old Brian. Um, yeah, I don't know what if you've... You... Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, what have you made of the last... Just the last few hours. It's unbelievable. I mean, you. what's amazing about uh, Brian Rose is his ability to just constantly dig himself deeper. And it's. I think it's from some kind of like reality warped, you know, world where he thinks he can get away with like pathological levels of lying. In this case, he's calling 15-year-old kids disingenuous. He's accusing them of lying and being unprofessional. And in reality, these kids, these young journalists are so sort of on their game. It's shocking because most of the time you're young, you don't know what you're doing. These kids though are so sharp that they captured all the receipts. So when he said they're lying, they, they showed up late. That's what he said. I didn't leave the interview early. They showed up late. They captured all the emails and they just showed it. They're like, no, you're, you're lying uh, again. And now it's gotten to the point where he's really just like in the mud fighting with 15 year olds and he's wrong. <laughs> it's absolutely hysterical. So, so I've, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, it is a personal um, pastime of mine now to just uh, kind of like check in on this and laugh all the way, because I do see it as a spiraling, you know, crash. It's just a slow car crash that will eventually come to a stop. Obviously he's not becoming mayor. Um, I don't think he's going to get out of this unscathed in terms of nobody finds this guy credible even, anymore. Even Dorian Yates uh, is like woken up to the whole Brian Rose thing. I think what's interesting though, is for the people who used to be fans and then now they're seeing what he's done now. And I think it's this whole like weird trip to have this guy put out some interviews you like and then, but become a complete psychopath on the other hand. Yeah. Yeah, so um, coffee. What I was saying to to Rebel, uh, to David earlier is that he he was, he has this very powerful work ethic that's mated to a, a very sick philosophy or very sick um, psychology, mm. and that's what's steering him wrong. And it's the same thing that's happening when he doubles down against these kids. That I, what I've just realized, he, he gave me another very good piece of wisdom um, or an insight. He said, "Hate always flows up." I think he was quoting Ice. Ice-T, who's one of his idols, 
Ice-T says that hate always flows up, right? And there is some truth to that. Most of the time, people who are complaining and judging other people are judging people at a higher level of socioeconomic strata or a higher level of success or a higher level of achievement. And it's usually, it usually comes from a place of bitterness. And I think what Brian mistakenly believes when he sees all this criticism is that he's the super su successful guy sitting at the top of the mountain. And these are all just haters that are, um, and this hate is flowing up towards him, which is then validating him. So he's thinking, well, I must be doing something right because hate always flows up. And what he doesn't realize is it's, Sure, a lot of it is hate. A lot of a lot of you guys hate the dude, but generally, it's it's more disdain and disbelief and, and incredulity at his um, his stupidity and his lack of self awareness. Well, not only that. I mean, I I think it's also like you said that that idea does come from some place, but I find that it's not as uh, at. Brian's level of fame, it's not as big as, of a deal as he says it is. The reason you get haters is because you become Justin Bieber levels of famous and people ha are kind of forced to watch you in pop culture because, you know, the most popular people are just shoved in everyone's faces. And you may not like watching Justin Bieber, so you kind of hate the guy just for the fact that he's shoved into your face. Brian Rose, on the other hand, he's not really that famous. I mean, he only gets like a thousand views per video. So there's actually a very narrow number of people who are still watching this guy. Um, which is what makes it interesting. And and yeah, if you look at the criticism, I mean, it's all like based around real things that have happened. None of it's like, I don't like Brian because of the goofy suits he wears. Although I could imagine a lot of people don't like that. But uh, it's like, hey, this guy is weaponizing free speech, then censoring all of his critics, bullying young journalists. Um, the list goes on and on. Manipulating the election by trying to bet on himself to manipulate poll results or uh, betting odds, and then saying that all the polls are wrong. It's like people don't like this guy for a very clear reason. Um, and it's just convenient sure. for him that he can just say, oh, it's just haters. Just like he conveniently says, none of the polls matter, but the but the gambling odds, which he's manipulated, uh, that that's what matters. Yeah. I wonder about maybe starting to come to some of the comments or some of the questions. Um, are there any more thoughts, Nick, before we move to that? Um, you know, I, I just keep coming back to the same, or I just keep having the same sentiment of, I really want something positive to come out of this, whether it's growth for all of us. Uh, and, and that is intrinsically or, or tied to a question that, I had to ask myself and I continue to ask myself, which is, and I, I do this with, with people, you know, sometimes you'll be with a friend or an associate and they, they'll be telling you about a relationship failure or a problem that they're having with someone. And the first thing I always say to them is, what would that person say if they were sitting here talking to me in, in your place? And I'm, I'm doing that kind of experiment on myself and I've, I've been doing that with the Brian Rose thing for a long time and I've asked myself the question, what is it that caused me on a on a deeper level to to enter this guy's orbit or for him to enter mine, right? Because I really do believe your vibe attracts your tribe. And and you know, I realized that for me it was an element of it was an element of greed. And I like all those things that he's projecting at this high level, they must have existed within me for me to be attracted towards what he was offering at some point or to want to work with him. You know, and I, I think. Um, we have to ask those questions and uh, maybe we can all use this as a lesson to to go beyond or, or to see this darkness within ourselves and go beyond it. And I know it sounds like I'm making excuses for the guy and I'm not, but I just really think that there, there has to be something higher towards uh, that, that comes out of all of this. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I, I've dealt with dealt with quite a lot or talked about and addressed quite a lot with spending a bit of time around like different spiritual communities. There's always this massive rift between this is exactly the, the experience that I've invited into my life to learn what I need to learn. And actually, no, this is a time where I need to set a boundary and I'm being exploited. And I've seen every single kind of like, I've, I've studied cults a lot. Um, I, I was going to do a documentary for Channel 4 about a cult. I've been involved on, on the outskirts of various kind of cults that friends were involved in. 
And my conclusion is that it's both. It's if if you don't, you have to call out bad behavior because there's some really good work on on narcissism and like cluster B personality disorders. On some level, they know what they're doing. Like most of the time, people who haven't dealt with people who are kind of wired that way assume that it's just trauma and they need to be loved more. They need to be understood more. Actually, you need like that's And that's why these people run riot, particularly in spiritual communities they tend to be wired that way or they tend to be kind of there's they're very uh easy niches for them to exploit and my conclusion is that on some level like there's different levels of reality it may be true at like this kind of ultimate non-dual perfect level that we get exactly the experiences that we need at the right moment to give us the experiences to grow and that's perfect but at the same time it might be you just need to set a fucking boundary and say no and and call this person out let other people sure. know do the the kind of the the hard work of 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 actually engaging with it on the reality level and i think these things exist at the same time and if we yeah. get confused between those levels then we can get into real trouble yeah i, I think that's the wisest or what, a very wise perspective on the whole thing you know the more i study and try to learn about the human experience the more i see over and over again this one um, particular phenomenon which is at the deepest levels of pretty much everything you will always find an inherent paradox and what you've just described is an inherent paradox it is my fault and it's brian's fault or it's my fault for being duped and uh it's his fault for being the duper you know or whatever the whatever way you want to frame that is so yeah i i agree with you 100 david so i might come to a couple of um, questions here. And if I, if I read out your name and you're happy to ask it yourself, if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask it, if you prefer that I did, uh, then just maybe let me know. But Tommy Holistic asked one that's kind of follows on from what we've been talking about now. I can read it out if Tommy Holistic doesn't want to. Oh, I, I can say something, if that's all right. Go for it. Hello. Uh, yeah, well, I just thought I would like, because I think there's a, a decent amount of sincerity in this group tonight. Um, but I also suspect that there might be a little bit of schadenfreude as well. I've, I've certainly lo looked at a lot of all this unfold and kind of enjoyed the downfall. But then also I don't enjoy the downfall because feeling good about him doing bad makes me feel a bit bad. So my question was something along the lines of, uh, I think I said, what, what can we learn uh, about ourselves or how can we better ourselves from how we've experienced the Brian for Mayor campaign in a way that is sincere? Hmm. And if anyone's got any suggestions or thoughts, whack them into the chat or raise hands as well and we can we can kind of do a collective intelligence thing um can i just I ask me it come it comes down to what i said before like knowing the difference between needing to draw a boundary and needing to look at what we've contributed to a situation is and that comes with discernment but i think we always have to hold both of those um but ultimately the only person that can change what's going on is the person himself and the people he surrounded himself with don't forget that there's a whole coterie of people who've surrounded him now and are doing who in some ways are, are at least as willfully involved and um enabling as anybody else sure can i ask um <laughs> i was gonna to address this man's question i was first thinking i guess it depends on what level you interacted with brian at like i feel like for nick he probably has a much different experience um than you know someone like me who saw this much more as an outsider some sort of watching this character sort of do things on screen and that probably is even different from the people who went through brian's course and who were promised all sorts of transformation and maybe never got it so i guess it depends um on what level you saw Brian to determine like what your reaction is. 
I much more lean on the like schadenfreude, um, but also I feel obligated to call out liars um, whenever and wherever they occur. I think it's like a really, we have bad, a bad mechanism for uncovering these people. And I just feel like you kind of at some point need people to just very directly call it what it is. Um, so that's the experience I'm at. So I don't know how like positive it is other than me trying to, you know, just do more of my mission, which is to uncover like fraudsters and liars. But I guess probably your experience and your, you know, um, ability to turn it into something positive just probably depends on where you, what level you interacted with Brian on, if that makes sense. Sure. Agreed. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. I think it, it's, it's going to be very individual. Um, and I, I only really got re-involved in this story. I, I kind of felt like it was, it was getting gratuitous last year and I stopped covering the story and it was only, it wasn't even the mayoral campaign. It was actually when the first times article came out that I was just like, I couldn't believe how much they dropped the ball and realized that this particular, like I probably knew the story as well as anyone and then wrote the unheard article and made the films about, about him again. And have kind of been involved in just kind of looking at, looking at the poverty because basically the mayoral campaign He's hacking the electoral process for, for, um, yeah, it's it's basic. He's basically scamming the electoral process. He's getting coverage. He never really got coverage for for London Real before. It always really eaten away at him. He even kind of flagged up the Vice articles like, oh, they're finally writing again about me for the first time. And he's had what 10, 20 different articles about him because he went for mayor of London. It's like you can't like as a journalist and as a Londoner, you can't do that. You, If you're going to put yourself up for scrutiny, you're going to hack the electoral process, you have to be held to like proper scrutiny. It's fine that he gets interviewed by journalists, but do your fucking job and ask him fucking questions. Like that for me is the passion that I felt. It's like, if no one else is going to fucking do it, I'm probably in as good a position as anyone. And that felt like a, that felt my, like my particular piece to hold in this in this thing and everyone has to hold their own particular piece um and that could be very different for different people depending on what role they played or what connections they had or um so yeah there's a couple of hands raised going to go um mohammed we are going to come to you but you're michael did have his hand up first um hey hi david hi everyone um, I want to say, first of all, thank you for a little time to speak uh, on some reflections of this conversation, which I found to be very, very, very incredibly on point and, and a real attempt and sincere attempt at sense making something that we can only really understand, I think, from different perspectives because it's so complex. And so I want to say uh, in that respect, I found it, uh, you know, fascinating. But also, I have one question, one particular question, which is: if he has no chance of winning, and us giving him this energy, could that even help? Could that even help him? Because people like that think all publicity is good publicity, right? For me, the running for mayor thing makes it different, and the the fact that I've just wanted to see some accountability. It's like but at the same time, like, is this helping him? I don't think it is helping him. I don't think this attention that he's in right now is helping him because I don't see where he goes in terms of, he can't really go back to getting people at, to, to interview people on London. Like his business models now are broken. I don't see where he goes. And I'd be interested to ask Coffee Zilla, who's had more experience with sort of different entrepreneurial scam merchant types where he goes. But as far as I can tell, if you've got people like Dorian Yates pulling out and saying, I'm not going to do it because you won't answer these questions. I, I think his current business model, he's broken his current business model. And the paradox is, I think if he had, I think he's been hoist by his own self-image. If he'd been prepared to just keep kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, there was an opportunity for just continuing to get on conspiracy theorists and not question them. And I'm not judging, I'm not judging kind of alternative narratives. I've got into this trouble before. 
But if you're just going to get people on and just going to continue to follow, like all these people who are getting thousands of millions of views earlier he in the pandemic. Been the next Alex Jones. He could, he he could, could have been, have been a Jones. new spiritual Alex Jones. That was what I was terrified about last year was there was this gap in the market for someone to basically, because Alex Jones has been banned, obviously. So there's someone who could have hoovered up all of that content on, on YouTube. And that's what I thought he was going to do because I thought he'd have been really, really good at it because he could have just said, no, I don't agree with these people. I'm just allowing them to speak. I'm not judging. And I think there were lots of different ways that he could have gone where, and I think his self-image just couldn't handle it. He wanted to be kind of like, he wanted to have status, like he wanted to go for mayor of London, which is ludicrous because he's got so much backstory and so many skeletons in his in his closets. Like it was a ludicrous thing for him to have tried to do. But I, there were things he could have done where he could have kept himself under the radar and hoovered up a lot more money and a lot more attention, a lot more gullible people. And I think he's torpedoed the whole thing. Um, what do you think, Coffee? Yeah, absolutely agree. I'm, I wanted to touch on the point about like, oh, do you want to just give oxygen to this, right? Um, so first, so two things on that. Number one, um, I think Brian, especially at the beginning, when I started covering all this, he was getting oxygen. And in fact, I mean, like, it's not like the guy had like, was getting views. He has less now. Uh, as a result of, I think, calling him out, people have just like sort of stopped tuning in, ironically. Uh, but he was getting a lot and nobody really was putting the pieces together because most viewers understandably don't have time to sort of chronicle all these bad actions. So some part of what I wanted to do was chronicle this and lay out and deconstruct this guy for the audience so they could see him for what he is. I, I think the word all publicity is good publicity. That's not always true. I think that's like that's one of those truisms, which sounds great, but is not always true. So sometimes being uh, sensationalist is good, right? Having like ha being shocking is good. It can get you attention. But being a scam, tricking people out of their money, there's kind of no context in which that makes you more desirable as like as someone to watch, right? Um, so this is something that I constantly come back to is like, no, Brian really has been hurt and people are rightfully wondering where does he go from here because his... His bad actions have been so well documented at this point that any endeavor he does is just going to be poisoned. Um, and it's poisoned precisely because people took the time to cover these issues. So um, I don't get too disheartened about that, like coverage stuff. I mean, I mostly hold to the fact that if you shine a light on things, it's better than if you didn't, than if you just ignored it. Um, uh, obviously, also, I take, I guess, um, some solace in the fact that I know for a fact that given his personality, he hates being mocked and ridiculed, which is why I, I take great pleasure in mocking him and taking him for what he is, which I think is a clown. It, when you take someone like Brian, he wants so badly to be taken seriously that when you turn him into the clown, then he that is un undermining everything that he is about. Someone said in the chat, is he a, not a poor man's Donald Trump? I think that there's some truth to that, although poor would be the the operative word in both senses because he's not doing the playbook effectively uh, he's not turning it around and turning it into like haters and the uh, or turning it into fake news properly donald trump he was able to play off people's suspicion of corporate media and play that as that's why i'm been getting hate ironically brian rose can't do that because the people hating on him are independent journalists who are paying attention they're really before a few months ago was nobody paying attention to him besides me David, and that's about it. <laughs> so um, that would be my response, kind of long-winded. But um, uh, yeah, I, long answer or short answer, I, I do think it's good that we're talking about these issues, and I do think it's hurting him in the long run. I'd, I'd love to ask Thomas Holgate. You shared a really interesting um, comment. And Paul, we'll come to you in a sec. I know you've got a comment about the courses community thomas if you want to unmute yourself uh, yeah hello, you? hello again david uh, and everyone um there i i've just i want to uh, address the irony of discussing narcissism in a group setting straight away um that's what i said in the group chat after asking a question earlier on but i wanted to like say what i really wanted to say when i previously asked a question about what can we learn about ourselves 
in a way that's genuinely helpful or how we can help this situation. Uh, and in the comment that I put, uh, I said, I, uh, I've seen pain in Brian's eyes that has made me cry. And as someone who has previously run for parliament, I've run in politics in the UK, perhaps with a self-interested slant, I've watched this mayoral campaign unfold with like a, uh, a flittering spectrum of hatred, admiration, partially I wish it was sincere, then I see this teenage interview unfold and I hear about the scams and it's like this. And uh, I just wanted to say like, I, I've seen these, I've seen every single clip of him that I think is online. Uh, from behind the scenes things to people like filming his manifesto launch and everything. And I guess to talk more about the, the pain behind his eyes, I think that that is something that I think we're getting around to addressing and that we're all sort of learning from. I've just seen someone say, how do you become a former narcissist? And uh, again, there's an irony in the fact that I'm even addressing that question in a public forum. Um, it is hardwired into the brain and it can't be cured. And it's a difficult thing. And it's not always enjoyable to deal with because it's like that, uh, the empty void that can't be filled. And so sometimes people go to extreme levels. And in a nutshell, I, I ran for parliament for the Peace Party in 2015 after leaving the Sun newspaper to do so. And in doing so, I wasn't willing to admit that it was a spiritual ego that was creeping through the back door and that there was no amount of attention that could have filled the hole within. And it's something that I've dealt with in other ways throughout the years. But I think that, yeah, I think he's going through a lot of bloody pain. And like to think like what he's doing to hoodwink so many people. And I've not lost £3,000 on one of his courses. I've just found him a mixture of amusing and deplorable and embarrassing and unbelievable and, you know, uh, questionably dressed but I think like what's he going through and that's that's what I was trying to ask my first question was about what how can we better ourselves and I suppose realistically again how ironic is it that a narcissist is answering his own question at the end of all this but no. I, I was really trying to think how how can I better myself because I've stayed up to 4 a.m sometimes I'm there, my eyes are closing. I want to see one more Brian Rose video. I want to see one more Coffeezilla video talking about Brian Rose. I want to see Coffeezilla reacting to Rebel Wisdom talking to Nick about Brian Rose. And I'm falling <laughs> asleep. I'm going, I don't like it. I don't like it. I love him. I hate him. You know, and so anyway, I think he's going through a shitload of pain, but it's not for me to say. Um, yeah, it's complex at best. But thanks for letting I me say that. My question is, does if you're wired that way, do you even know that that's what you're feeling? I suspect that having a relationship with your own feelings is something that, like, I, I doubt it very much. Because um, who, who can you talk to about it? Who are you actually, who do you have an honor? Like, sometimes we don't even know what we feel. That's why therapy works because we often don't know what we feel until we talk about it, until we express it, until we find words for it. And if you don't have anyone around you that you have that relationship with, I think in some ways you literally don't have, you don't have a relationship to your own inner world. And I suspect that there's some of that going on. I wouldn't, I mean, I feel, unco I feel more uncomfortable about sort of psychoanalyzing than talking about the effect or the, or, or that, but that's, that's my sense is that you, that path of developing that sense of relationship to your own inner world and then relationship to others and that kind of that that very long developmental process i suspect that that gets that gets interrupted with narcissism like if you've seen narcissism the most amazing they don't develop because they can't learn because they can't admit error if you can't admit error and you can't you you literally can't look at yourself i've seen seen it really over the last few years in various people it's like it locks you into a really stunted level because you're in a closed, you you're in a closed system huh you you operate within a closed system if you cannot admit error so there's no feedback loop right because you're always right because you cannot admit error so that that means there's no growth right and that means there's no self-awareness yeah 
which is yeah i mean the the, the paradox of the irony of the fact that it's called london real is just <laughs> it's 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 perfect that's why the whole thing is perfect on so many levels it's just it's it's astonishing it's just perfection in its own way um paul um You've been waiting quite a while. I know you've got a little bit to share about your experience. You're muted. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I was a member back in uh, 2015. So I was there from pretty much the start. I joined in late December, I think 2015. And by March I was gone because I joined on the back of, I was seeing the great podcast interviews. I believe the first one I saw was the one with Jeff Thompson. So it was Nick, Brian, and whoever was the guest in the middle. And they were very, very good chats. And it was really when Nick left and it started being all about Brian that I completely lost interest. So I met Brian Rose at the first London Rail event in March of 2016. And really, it was a fantastic event, but it was a fantastic event in spite of Brian Rose, not because of him. It was because of the people whom I met there, the members they provided the the real value to me. The the podcast, it was great. Uh, Like the guests were initially great. I think they declined in actual quality because uh, Brian was chasing clout and he was judging the quality of his members based on the size of their following as opposed to the quality of the content they'd cover during an interview. Uh, I wrote something in a message to you just before this in a private message, I, I think it's worth reading out because I, I think there's a lot to be learned from it. So I said, I believe that Brian Rose is the physical embodiment of what Carl Jung would describe as the shadow, the aspects of our personalities that we choose to reject and repress. He is ego personified, ego personified, and that's why everything he does and has done is driven by selfish greed. And through documenting it and publishing his entire journey over the last decade, he's shown us all what not to do. And in this regard, he will remain our greatest teacher. And I think ego is a huge thing because it doesn't just describe him, but it also describes us. I think the reason why we're so susceptible to gurus and people claiming that they have knowledge that we lack is because we believe deep down on on an unconscious level that we're not good enough, that we need to learn more. And characters like that and the gurus that CoffeeZilla does a great job in exposing will always exist. And it's up to us to really address that, that's a problem within ourselves. I think the answer is essentially forming a a group of 20 to 30 like-minded people with similar values, but with different skills and strengths who can call each other on, you know, who will call you on your bullshit, keep you on track, yet at the same time, give you encouragement and an environment in which you can grow and develop and become the person you want to become. So whether you want to become an expert in a certain area, but it's when you fall prey to a guru that's claiming to be everything to everyone, such as when Brian just diluted what he was doing and started presenting himself as a guru and a teacher. I think what he really teaches is through you viewing his whole journey. It wasn't in the courses that he was charging people big money for, but there's a lot that you can learn. And there's a lot of good aspects regarding Brian Rose that I will say, like his work ethic is incredible. Like the amount of dedication slash obsession that he's put into Love and Real. Can you imagine if he put that into something really great and productive? Like I think what he should have done was stick with the original podcast and just being a podcast interviewer and built a whole business based on building a community that he would serve and make money through the cross promotions by helping people sell their courses, true experts, rather than be, you know, trying to take control and have his ego have positioned himself as the expert on everything. I think that was the start of his downfall. Thanks, Paul. I wonder if there if there's anyone else here who has sort of personal stories, experiences, um, if they want to share them, if they could either raise their hand or or note it in the chat and we'll we can make space for that, especially if it was a positive experience. Uh Plamen, you've got your hand up. In the next few days, we know that he's not gonna well, we hope he's not gonna become a London mayor. Do you think that he will go back? I mean, he will take time to reflect on 
all the things that he's achieved. And he will go back to doing what you guys started as something good and positive that enriches communities, enriches audiences. So I think he's going to be moved into a place where he's forced, he's just forced to examine himself because the weight of that ego, the weight of this massive failure, the weight of the fact that everyone doesn't like him, it has to find a crack in that shell that he's created around himself. It has to sooner or later. I, I really, I hope it does. Um, I know I didn't really answer your question uh, with a, a definitive yes or no, um, but that's the best I got. I, I could see Coffee was definitely agreeing with that. I totally disagree. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah I think it's... Um... I think it's wishful thinking that Brian's going to have some big come to Jesus moment. Uh, I think he's going to continue to pivot and lie. And look, I mean, I, I'm a big believer. You believe someone when they tell you who they are. And I've been repeatedly told what kind of person Brian is. I've also noticed that um, people tend, I mean, it can happen, but how many people do you know that fundamentally change who they are at 50 plus years of age? Uh, not a lot. So for me, I mean, I'm going to make sure that Brian doesn't scam anybody, but I don't have any. And, and again, this just comes back to, you have much more of a history with him, Nick. So I think it's natural for you to hope for some kind of like a, uh, uh, redemption arc for somebody who was once your, like your buddy. And, you know, you had this whole relationship with, but from where I'm standing, and maybe it's a benefit and a curse that I'm on the outside of this, uh, that, that, I, I mean, I think the chance is about a zero of this big, this big moment happening with Brian. I, yeah, I can maybe take the middle place here. Um, actually, it's more agreeing with you, uh, Coffee. But um, I've, I, 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 I think those of us who are in sort of, a personal, like a growth mindset, like a personal growth mindset who are looking for kind of ways of improving ourselves, who are looking, who are involved in relationships where we're getting feedback and we're moderating our behavior. And maybe that we've had like life-changing moments of, of transformation. Like we've, we've dealt with some patterns or like that has happened. Like we know that that's a thing. I think we have, because I went through this period, quite an intense, painful period over about three years with two specific relationships, one with a housemate who was um, a, a massive, like a real narcissist. And I just kept thinking, it's like, if I, if I could only have that conversation with him about this thing, then we'd get to the other side. And I would continue to try this. And another was with the family member. It was just like, and with this family member, it was like, oh, well, if I speak to their friend, like their friend that they've known since they were seven, that friend will be able to get through to them. And what happened was this person just cut off more and more and more of their relationships to the point where they even cut off this person who they've been friends with since they were seven and literally cut off everyone else from the entire family. And this guy ended up moving out. I, it got to the point, the relationship deteriorated to the point where I had to lock my door at night because I was so worried about what he might do because there was this so much anger in him that he wasn't even aware of, even though he'd never kind of de demonstrated any of it. I was just like, I don't think he knows what he's capable of. And now I'm like his main enemy because I'm trying to kind of come up to him and show him this mirror. And that was a real learning experience because in, in the back of my mind, I'm just like, oh, well, if we only had that one conversation, if only that person said that to them, they'd finally realize and I think, I don't know if, th there are some lessons that I don't think you can have unless you've had that experience. Whenever I have this conversation with people around like cluster B personality disorders or like really deluded people, I don't think you can know it until you've experienced it because most of us are not wired that way and most of us don't understand how it works. So I think I would have said that I was probably in your position, Nick, maybe three years ago where I would have been looking at Brian and thinking, wow, like when the London mayor thing collapses, then he'll be forced to confront himself. Then it will become clear. Then he, like his way forward is to kind of, has to be a mere culpa. It has to be a like, this is what I did. This is why I did it. And I'm sorry, but some people aren't wired that way. But some people, it's worse than that because some people can actually weaponize that process. 
they can get good enough at the game to say, oh, well, everything's ended. So what I need to pretend to do now is to admit to seeing the light, is to, is to pretend to apologize. And so that kind of loop, like some people, the more, the more feedback you give them about their behavior, the worse it makes them, the better it makes them at weaponizing yeah. their pathology against everyone else. Mm-hmm. That's a very astute observation. And if anyone was going to do that, weaponize that, uh, that mere culpa moment, it would be Brian. If any if anyone is going to do that, it's going to be him. Um, I just I was reminded of a quote that I've been reflecting on lately, which is, "You can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality." And I kind of just wonder if maybe that's it's kind of more what I was uh, describing. Coffee is not that he would reach a point of redemption through any inherent goodness or self reflexivity, but just that. Uh, the weight of the consequences of his delusions would ultimately bring him to a place where he's just got nowhere to turn. Like, I'm pretty sure that his relationship will disintegrate at some point, his prime relation between he and his wife. Um, And I'm pretty sure that this business is going to implode if it hasn't already, as David's given reasons for. And, you know, his reputation has been forever tarnished. It's, It's ruined. His reputation is in tatters. And so basically, if you imagine you're like, I don't know, varnishing a floor in a room and eventually like, it's a, it's a classic phrase, he's painted himself into a corner. He's going to have to scream for help or he's going to have to, I don't know, maybe he's got enough, I don't know if he's got fuck you money where he can just, you know, like live with that ego and its, its consequences forever. I don't think so. I think something's got to give. But again, that's where Coffee and I will, I think we'll continue to disagree. So we're getting close to the end, and yeah, I didn't know quite what this what this call was going to be, um, what would emerge from it. Um, what I'm going to suggest is, Paul, could you put the link in the chat to the Facebook group, um, the London Real Facebook group? Because then, if people yeah, that, want to connect to each other, like what I what I, I really found your sharing in that group really beautiful, and I think another couple of people saying even though they they felt really burned by the experience they met some amazing people through it so i'm going to yes. suggest that we put that facebook group there and if you want to join it to connect with other people who've maybe gone through the experience what i'd love is for people to to set up as, as i think a couple of people shared before like if there's a kind of regular support group or accountability group or something like that that people are in need of or want to set up that's what i'd love to to see well, happen. It's something David, that... can I just say that's exactly what I've built with 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 my community tribe shift. I built that just coming out of London Real in March of 2016. I quit it immediately the moment I met Brian Rose, and that's exactly what I've been doing ever since. It's not, I have a podcast related to it, but it's not a money making venture at all. It really is just to connect with like minded people and help them however and whenever I can. So it ties in with what you're doing. There's other people, you know, well, I'm going to interview Nick for my podcast as in I followed him. It ties in with what he's doing. So there is a huge correlation between what many individuals are doing in that regard. So I believe there's a lot to come out of this as in there is a cliche that politics makes strange bedfellows. It also connects people like as in Brian Rose ultimately as disconnected as he is from himself and his own purpose, he's actually connected a hell of a lot of people together in a good way, albeit not consciously. So there's a lot of good to come out of this. So I believe the demise of London Real, there'll be a birth of a whole new community of people that will come together as a result of that. Yeah, and I... I ha- yeah, so do check out. We just put the the Facebook. I put the I put chat. the link in. It's in there. The Facebook. Can you put it in again, just because it will. Um, okay, sure. There's, there's a few other messages that got in there there yeah. afterwards. Um, yeah, and I'll keep an eye on that group as well, and we'll see whether there might be a, a, a need to to kind of do something like this again. Nick, do you want to talk about your? What are you up to? You've got your your podcast. Um, have you got any other things going on at the moment? Yeah, thank you. Um, my podcast is Liberation Mentor. If you search Liberation Mentor in any one of the podcast apps, you'll find it. And then for the men watching, the men listening, uh, I wrote a book on uh, my what I believe are the 20 most 
important tips and principles for a, ha- a healthy, balanced masculine um, essence or how to have a healthy, balanced masculine essence. And if you go to my site, liberationmentor.com forward slash aligned, you can get a copy of that book. If you don't want to put your email address in, just email me directly and I'll send you a copy. Awesome. And we've got a Recovering from Brian Rose course, only $3,000 uh, starting. <laughs> it's an eight-week course. And let me guess, it's just this video <laughs> sold back to us, right? <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah. This was it, actually. Um, I, I've already deducted it from your bank accounts when you signed up, so um, it's all good. Um, Coffee, what are you? What are you up to? You've got another Brian Rose film coming out very soon. Oh yeah, I, I just can't. I mean, I'm just milking this for everything it's worth. I, I, I get a personal kick out of this. In addition to, um, you know, thinking it's valuable, I get the double benefit of just happening to really have a good time while I do it. So I'll be doing that. I'll probably be live streaming the um, the election um, if I can, if I can find a good time for it. I was talking to you earlier about like what's the best time to do that. But uh, yeah, that's that's basically what I've going, got going on. And then the rest of, I mean, I'm just moving on to the new clowns of the internet to talk about and fraudsters and uh, yeah. You're doing God's work, Coffee. Hey, thanks. Thanks. What? Well, I enjoy it. I don't, I don't take any credit for it because I, I, I enjoy it. So it's not, it's not like I'm some altruist over here. I just have a great time. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, and I am going to do a soft pitch for the Rebel Wisdom digital campfire when we come together and do calls like this two or three times a week. I'm, I'm going to be genuine. Like when this is, when the London mayor race is over, I'm going to be like, this has been the most interesting story from a personal perspective. and. I just, yeah, I think, I genuinely think some people are are kind of, it's like a sort of story arc. It's a story arc that is kind of someone had to do to show everyone else that this really wasn't a good idea. And someone had to be the villain. Someone had to play the role of villain, right? Yeah. It's not easy being exactly. the villain. And yeah, and thank you for everyone who's joined. Thank you for the really great questions. And look forward to seeing you again sometime soon join the facebook group we'll keep an eye on it and see what comes out of this little kind of crazy coming together of everyone who's been through the london real orbit over a long time thanks Jim. thanks for coming Take care. thanks nick thanks coffee and see everyone soon the film you just watched was a conversation that happened in rebel wisdom's digital campfire so to join conversations like this to submit questions stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel check out the membership options there's three different levels of membership sense makers get to join our regular sense maker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around and also the monthly wisdom gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.